Hi, my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist here at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And the majority of my job is working on bumblebee conservation. And I'm here to talk to you today about bumblebee citizen science, about what it is, why we are encouraging folks to get involved, and then how you could get involved or encourage other people to get involved um, as you move forward. Um, so the first question in this whole deal is, what is bumblebee citizen science? Um, which is a fair question. Um, hopefully you know what a bumblebee is. If you don't, there's a picture of one. Um, and citizen science is kind of a, well, it's been around for a long time. Um, but it's a, it's a way that, that most anybody can get involved in contributing to science efforts. And in this case, the effort that we're looking for is um, folks to get out and, and take pictures of bumblebees, which helps us collect information information about where bumblebees live, about where they're thriving, the habitats that they need, the flowers that they like. And so what we're asking folks to do, and this could be really anybody, any age, any education level, um, any status out there, basically if you're a person you can get involved. Um, and, and what you're going to help do is actually contribute to the scientific information that we have that allows us to make informed conservation conservation decisions. And so that, that is what bumblebees citizen science is. Diving in a little bit deeper, you know, bumblebees are, are native bees. There's about 50 species here in North America, and they're really essential pollinators in many landscapes out there in North America. But um, we also know that some of them are in trouble. We have species that are in the Endangered Species Act, um, or that have been added to the Endangered Species Act, and there are several other candidate species. So some some populations are declining. Um, but we don't have really great information about bumblebee distribution information or about what flowers they're using or what habitats are really important to them. So the more information that we can collect, the better off we are. And if I was to gather together a team of, of scientists, of, of professional paid scientists, to go on an expedition across North America to try to collect this information, it would be super fun <laughs> and we'd all love it. But it would take us years to collect those data, probably 15 years, maybe 20 years, to cover the entirety of North America. Um, and by the time we were done, the data would no longer be useful. Um, so what we're hoping to do, or what we have been doing really for a decade now, is training folks, teaching them how to get involved, and then they can submit that information for us. And we already then have a network spread out across North America where we can collect this information in a short period of time. and then. Um, us, those of us that are trained um, conservation biologists and trained taxonomists, we can focus our time on doing the analysis and not collecting the data. So you get to do the fun part and I get to sit at my computer and figure out what it all means. Um, so that's what we're asking folks to do and that's really what it is. Um, and so why do we need bumblebee citizen science? I, I, I mentioned this really briefly um, a couple of slides ago, um, but there are some really compelling reasons that we, we, for, that we do need bumblebee citizen science. And just for some background information, the main reason that we're really having this conversation is because pollination has become a major conversation across North America. And a lot of it is, um, is directed or led by this creature right here, which is the European honeybee. Um, when most people think about bees, this is the animal that they are thinking about. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is actually a non-native species. This is introduced to the United States um, in, in the 1600s for honey production and wax production. Um, and these are, you know, in the, in the bee world, they're kind of weird. No other native bee makes honey. They don't live in these huge colonies and they don't overwinter together. So in some ways, this animal isn't really an appropriate bee when we're really talking about bees in general. I know that sounds weird. This is a bee that isn't really a bee. But, but there are 20,000 species of bees in the world and only five of them or so make honey like this one. Um, so so we, we need to sort of step outside of this honeybee box when we're thinking about bee conservation on the, on the larger landscape. 
Um, the other thing is that for the most part, honeybees are managed. They live in boxes and they're moved around by people that manage them, which also creates just very different conservation and different management issues. Um, but nevertheless, honeybees are in dramatic decline. Since the 1950s, we've seen a really sharp drop off in the number of managed hives and the majority of our feral colonies, those that live in trees and, and other places out in the wild, have pretty much disappeared for the most part. There's some evidence that they may be now coming back, but for a while they were those feral colonies were, were pretty much absent. There are a ton of reasons for this. One of them is honey prices. There's just fewer and fewer people that are interested in managing honeybees because the, the return isn't as great as it was at one time. But then there's a lot of things going on in the landscape that are causing these declines as well. Disease, pesticides, and pests. So a lot of other things that are uh, affecting European honeybees. <clears throat> Um, but European honeybees, the majority of their pollination services are really in our crop landscape. Outside of farmscapes and landscapes, we have these beautiful native lands that are often covered with native plants. And for the most part, honeybees aren't in those landscapes and these flowers are dependent on our native bees for pollination services. So we need to have a diverse set of native bees out in the landscape to pollinate the diverse wildflowers that we have out there. Um, and we have 3,600 species, at least 3,600 species here in the United States and Canada um, to help us do that. Um, and these native species are really the insurance policy against losses of the European honeybee, right? If those declines continue happening, um, we really need to have these guys, not just for our, um, our native lands, but also we need them to help contribute to crop pollination as we see continued declines in the European honeybee. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we know some of these native bees are, are suffering similar declines as, um, as the European honeybee. And, and we know the most about bumblebees because they're large and charismatic um, and there's 50 species of them, so they're fairly well studied. So a study that, that I helped put together with, with the North American Bumblebee Specialist Group for the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, which is a mouthful, um, but we, we did an analysis of the, of the bumblebees in North America and what we found is about a quarter of them are facing some degree of extinction risk. Four of them are crit critically endangered on the IUCN red list, two of them are endangered, and then we have a number that are vulnerable or near threatened. So a quarter of our bumblebees are facing some degree of extinction risk, which is concerning because when it comes to the European honeybee, when we think about declines, we're not really thinking about extinction. Those are just problems with a, with a managed species. It's very different for our native species when we talk about declines and extinction risk. We're talking about extinction, which is forever. It's not just fewer bees on the landscape. Um, it's truly that these animals could disappear forever. Um, and so we know these animals are in decline and we need to know more about them. We need to know where they're living. We need to know what flowers they're using. We need to know what ecosystems they're associated with. And this is a map of the counties in the United States. And it shows where we have the most information about bumblebees. Um, and I'm going to go forward and then I'll come back to this slide. This is a map of population density in the United States. The redder um, squares or the redder counties are where we have the highest population density. So Southern California, um, the Eastern Seaboard, um, and a lot of the Eastern United States, high population density. And if I go back to the bumblebee sampling density, you can see where we have the most bumblebee information is either in a population center or in mountains close to a population center. So the Sierra are covered, the Cascades are covered, the Rockies are covered, and then we have good coverage in this in the Northeast where there's high population density. But in a lot of the rest of the country, we have no idea or very little data has been collected. So we need to get more information in these areas. And it's really hard for me living in Portland to get out here and sample bumblebees across this vast landscape um, in, in, in a large part of the United States. States. 
And the same is true in Canada. The southern portion of Canada is pretty well sampled. The further north you get, you know, hardly anyone has looked for bumblebees up there, which is a problem if you're trying to institute on the ground conservation efforts. It's hard to say that we should be working here when we don't have really enough data to say that much about it. So this is this is the reason that we need more data and 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 the reason that you can help is because um, I, if I can ask all you to help and some of you live in this area, the data that you collect will contribute to the amount of information that we can gather. Um, and so what we've learned, we over the last couple of years, I've had a project going on here in the Northwest called the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and this is what bumblebee sampling density looked like before that project in that area. And what I want you to do is I'm gonna go forward and just show you how that changes once we have a focused citizen science effort where people are getting out in the landscape in diverse areas. It hasn't completely changed the map, but you can see in a lot of areas, it's gotten a lot redder. We've gotten better coverage as we've gotten citizen scientists out on the landscape. So we're learning more and more in some of these areas where we didn't have as much information. As we add in citizen science data, we are learning more and more about bumblebee distribution, which is really helpful for me trying to make conservation decisions. Um, we also know that bumblebee, that Bumblebee citizen science can make really valuable um, scientific contributions. So these are all at-risk bumblebee species, Bombus affinis, which is the rusty patch bumblebee, Crotch's bumblebee, which is native to California, the western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, the yellow banded bumblebee, Bombus tricola, and then Bombus impatiens is an eastern species that's very common, but we've actually been able to track an invasion into the Pacific Northwest as it's escaped from um, from uh, managed hives or from boxes basically that are sold for pollination services. That's a completely different question and conversation that we could have that I won't get into. But nevertheless, the important takeaway message from this slide is that these are all observations that citizen scientists have shared. So these are highly imperiled animals that we need to know where they're living. And these are all observations that were shared on Bumblebee Watch, which is our Bumblebee Citizen Science webpage or portal for submitting data. And all of this really helps us to make conservation decisions. And just to point out how helpful this is, the map on the left here is a map of a, of a scientific study that was done by Sydney Cameron and her team back in 2011. And they searched for bumblebees, a huge effort across a lot of the Western United States. And each one of these circles is an area that they searched for bumblebees. The size of the circle tells us how many bumblebees they collected at that location. And then the little orange wedge that you see here tells us how many of those animals were their target species, which in this case was Bombus occidentalis or the western bumblebee. And you can see that this huge scientific area that covered a vast portion of the United States, they did find some western bumblebees, particularly in the Rockies, but up and down the west coast they were pretty unsuccessful at finding areas with the western bumblebee. They did find a few places in southern Oregon, but for the most part in northern Oregon and Washington they found none. And these are bumblebee citizen scientists uh, Western bumblebee citizen science observations that were shared. So our citizen scientists were in some cases more successful than um, this scientific effort at finding valuable um, information. And I'm not trying to say that this study was not worth it or that it wasn't valuable. I'm just saying in addition to that, adding citizen science observations makes really important um, contributions that we otherwise would not have. The same is true for the rusty patched bumblebee. Here's the map. Um, you can see they were unable to detect uh, the rusty patched bumblebee in the lower Midwest um, and in the far upper Midwest as well as along the eastern seaboard. And citizen scientists have contributed valuable information for what is now an endangered species, um, which is super great. Um, and, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is actually using data from Bumblebee Watch to help them make their decisions about this species as they go forward with a recovery plan. So, um, Bumblebees are essential pollinators. We know they're in decline. We don't have enough information about where they're distributed. And that's where, we that's where you come in. That's why we need folks out in the landscape submitting data to help us make some of these decisions. 
Um, so th that's the plea, um, and now this is the hopefully you're sold, and you want to know, okay, great, I know, I get it, I get it, now just tell me how to get involved, and that's where I'm going now. So now I'm going to tell you sort of where, when, and how to get involved in all of these different projects. Or it's really one project. but So the where and when is pretty easy. Um, where is basically anywhere you want to get involved. And when is when you see flowers in bloom and bees visiting them. You can take a picture of a bee visiting a flower anytime, anywhere. It really doesn't matter. Um, I do have some targeted areas that would be great to survey. Um, I've put away from population centers in bold here because we already know a lot where people are living in cities. And so we're trying to encourage people to get sort of outside of the of their backyard. Um, I'm not saying I don't want backyard data, but in addition to backyard data, it would be great to get out on a hike or out in the mountains or, or along a river and, and, and submit some observations from there. So meadows, riparian areas, brown fields and green spaces, gardens, but particularly try to also get away from those population centers and help us find out what's happening in the more rural areas of the United States. Um, the best time to look is in midsummer. That's when most bumblebees are out. That's when workers are out. So there's going to be more bumblebees out in the landscape. So June, July, and August, for the most part, are the best times of year to look. Um, although depending on where you live, they could be active year-round or at least starting in February through October. Um, and there are going to be some specific projects out there like the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas has a very specific window where we're asking people to get involved and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so there may be some specific projects that have specific goals and time frames but for the most part anywhere that there are flowers and bees is a great time to get involved. Um, how to get involved. What, what, what do you need? Um, there are different levels at which you need to get involved or, or you don't need to get involved. There are different levels at which you can get involved. The very basic level to get involved are incidental observations and these are just the I'm in my backyard, I see a bee, I take a picture of it, I submit it to the website. It's that that simple. Um, we're stepping things up a little bit in 2019 and we're adding a, what's called a checklist which is where you can out and go out into a landscape, it even could be your backyard and you're actually going to do a timed survey where we're actually going to get effort associated with that survey and we'll learn more information from that. And then there are also some focused efforts. The Zero Society and partners are running the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas and we have other partners that are doing efforts in Wisconsin and Minnesota as well as in Canada. So those are partner efforts that you can um, get involved with. I'm going to go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. Um, incidental observations are great because you can they can take place anywhere, anytime, as long as you have a camera um, and then an ability to upload photos to our website later, you can participate. That's really all that you need. This can be really fun. It can be kind of like a, a you know, if you're on a hike with kids or with your friends, you can go out on a scavenger hunt and try to find bumblebees and take photos of them. So it can add to a family experience or your own personal experience if you just want to go out and get involved. We're going to learn information about distribution here and we're also going to learn what plants these animals are using because in many cases they're included in the photo as you can see um, here on the left. The drawback of these is that these tend to be centered in population centers. People live in population centers, so that's where we get the data from. Um, and so it also tends to be biased towards more common species. If you only submit a photo of one animal on a day, chances are you're going to see a common animal and not a, a rare animal. Um, the other sort of corollary to that is if we ask people to look for these rare species, sometimes the information actually gets biased towards those rare or endangered species, which is also a problem as well. Um, and so we want to be able to fill in the details between super common and super rare. Um, and then we also, when, when you do a survey like this, it lacks information about effort. We don't know how much time you spent looking to find that one picture, and, and it's hard to tell that species were not there. We can only tell what is there, and so that's a problem from a conservation perspective as well. But as I mentioned, there are lots of benefits. Um, this is just why we have some of the more focused projects in addition to incidental observations. Um, the things that you need to get involved are really just a camera and some access to the internet 
internet. We have smartphone apps that work, and we also have a web app. Um, and and um, we'll provide links to those uh, at the end of the video here. So all the data for our incidental sightings as well as some of the other projects I'm going to share are, are, um, are entered into our Bumblebee uh, citizen science web portal which is called Bumblebee Watch. The URL is bumblebeewatch.org. We also have an iOS app called Bumblebee Watch and we have an Android app called Bumblebee Watch as well and the process is pretty similar in all of those although the apps are, are different than the web app and I'm going to show you how to submit um, data on the web app here. So the first thing you need to do is go out and collect or take a photo of a bumblebee on a flower. Um, it's also really important to note the day or the date um, and, and, uh, and the location where you took the photo because we need that information um, as you submit the data. Um, so just that's important to note. And sometimes that information is available in the photo file itself. So um, if you forgot, sometimes it's worth looking in the details of the photo. Um, but when you're going to take that photo and upload it to Bumblebee Watch, um, and once you've uploaded it, um, the the picture will show here on the left um, and you're going to go through an identification guide process. This is interactive so um, it's going to ask you to sort of look at different parts of the bumblebee's body and choose what hair color that you see in those parts. In this case it's the face. Do you see yellow hairs or black hairs? Um, and the same thing with the thorax and the same thing with the abdomen. And so as you make those choices it's going to narrow down the potential species matches based on the descriptions and whether their hair, their hair color patterns match what you've selected. Um, and then once you think you have a potential match, you're going to make that selection. Um, but it's important to note that uh, this is, you don't have to be an expert or you don't even have to know the name. There's an option here on the bottom that you actually can't see that says I don't know or unknown, um, which is totally fine. We have a team of verifiers whose job it is to go in and actually look at these photos and put a final name on these animals, um, a, a final determination. So you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know the species name. We put this part in there as sort of an educational piece so you can learn as you go along and start to understand what are the different parts of the body to look at as you're trying to identify different species. Um, and so eventually your, your sighting will get verified and you'll get an email when it does get verified that someone's looked at your photo and they've put a final name on it. Um, so that's, that's great. And those are incidental sightings. Um, so I, I mentioned this is a new project, but um, starting in 2019, we're adding a new data submission portal to Bumblebee Watch, which are going to be called checklists. And these won't be available for everybody. They're sort of available for our power users. So if this is something that you're interested in, please get in touch with us and I can potentially open up this portal for you. But these are, checklists are great because they're timed and they're effort based. So so we'll know how much time was put in, how much space that you surveyed, and that allows us to do a little, to learn a little bit more about how many bees are in that area, which can help us make sort of different decisions. So um, these can also happen anywhere. They can be your backyard or the summit of Mount Hood, um, and we also get more detailed information about the site. They can be sampled over time, so you could start a long-term monitoring project if you're doing a restoration project, or even if you want to know how adding native plants to your backyard changes the bumblebee fauna, you could start a long-term you know, data monitoring project using this method. Um, and we're also going to learn distribution, host plant information, and basic population data, which is great. Um, Again, some of the drawback here is these tend to be in population centers. They lack systematic support. So if you're out there just doing a checklist on your own, you know, you're not going to get the feedback or help that you might in a more focused program like I'm going to talk about next. Um, and these are a bigger time investment. This is more time than just sort of taking a photo on, on a hike. This is, says, you know, I'm going to do a survey, I'm excited about this, and I'm willing to put in, you know, a couple of hours of collecting um, data and, and entering data. It's a couple hour um, commitment as opposed to just a, you know, I found a bee on a flower and I'm going to submit it right now, which is more of like a five, five minute commitment. So it's a bigger, bigger deal, but we get more information out of it, which is why we're encouraging folks 
folks um, to do this. Checklists are, um, at this point, they're 45 minute time surveys. Um, and this, this is, it's people minutes. So if you have three people doing a survey, it's a 15 minute survey, because 15 times three is 45. So it's 45 sort of person minutes. Um, and it's important that this is search time. So if it takes you a, a little bit of time um, to sort of capture a bee and take a picture of it, um, you shouldn't include that, only the, the time searching. Um, and we were encouraging people in this time period to capture all different bees. Um, and uh, so if they look different, you don't want to catch a hundred of the same species of bees because um, then we're going to lose those rare species. Um, and then you're going to take all of those bees and actually put them into a vial like this. We have plastic, plastic options or glass options or you can use Ziploc bags or whatever whatever you have at home works just fine and then you can put um, those into a cooler with ice and that actually chills the bees down so that you can actually take them out and take a picture of them while they're still uh, um, and then they can slowly warm up and they'll fly on about their business as if nothing ever happened to them and again the bumblebee data is going to be submitted to bumblebeewatch.org but you're going to need special permissions to have access to the checklist portal so if you're interested in this or you have other people you know that are interested, please have them get in touch um, with us. Um, and then sort of the next level beyond that are these more focused efforts. Right now, the biggest focused effort that the Zero Season Society is involved with is called the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. And here, this is only in the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho for now. Um, but the, this is really great because it provides a ton of information. It's a systematic sampling method. We have a team of people that are supporting the volunteers out on the landscape. Um, you can get a t-shirt. Um, and all kinds of other things. Um, so there's, there's a lot of great reasons to be involved here, but obviously some of the drawbacks are this is even a bigger investment of time than, than the checklists, um, and it's a limited geographical scope. So we're not all over North America doing this at this point. Um, we can keep our fingers crossed that that might happen someday. Um, but right now we're just focused in this three state area. Um, this is what the grid cells look like. So what we're asking folks to do in this case is not just to do a checklist anywhere, but to actually adopt a grid cell. So we've broken up the three state area up into equal area grids and we're asking folks to go out and say, hey, I want to sample there and choose that spot and basically go on a bumblebee watching adventure. You know, put some friends in the car or the family in the car and, you know, go on a, a day hike and do a bumblebee survey while you're out there. Um, the, the survey method is, is basically basically the same as the checklists. It's going to be a timed survey. Um, you can learn a lot, a whole lot more about how to get involved. I can, I can do an hour talk about how to um, get involved in the Pacific North of Bumblebee Atlas. But if you live in this area and you're interested, please go to pnwbumblebeeatlas.org and you can learn more of the resources. You're also welcome to get in touch with us directly if, um, if you're interested and want to get involved in this project. Um, so that's that's basically it. Uh, I've sort of given you the the, the plea and, and the pitch as to why we need this information. I think I've told you how to get involved, um, and there's many different levels at which you can get involved, either sort of your casual um, level of just taking photos, which are fantastic, or the more in-depth information of the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and hopefully we can find a way to get you involved in a way that meets your needs and your availability. Um, and the really important thing to just keep in mind is, is this, we're not just asking folks to do this because it's something to do. Like it actually contributes to conservation information that we otherwise would not have. I just can't travel all over the United States, nor can the rest of our team. So we need your help collecting this information and, and really, really value it. So um, thank you in advance for, for contributing. Um, and that's all I've got. Thanks a lot for watching.